minutes. So if you go to readings and homework, I've posted Thursday's homework. Okay, there's a lot to read, but there's a reasonable amount to do. Okay, don't don't freak out. Thank you. Okay, so there's some more written work that you're going to turn in. Okay, follow instructions very carefully. Okay, read carefully. Then part C, we're actually going to be you're going to be creating some graph and calculator GC files. And then you're going to be e replying to your TA's email. Your TA is going to email you tomorrow afternoon. Don't change the subject line. Don't write anything in the, in the message. Just reply with your three GC files attached. Okay. If you want to talk to your TA, start a new email. They're not going to read these emails. It's just to gather up the files. Okay. So that's part C. And then part D, we're going to have a quiz at the beginning of class Thursday. And here's a close version of it, okay? Here's a close version of the quiz that we'll have Thursday. So, it's going fast. Tuesday, Thursday class, this is going to, the material is going to feel like it's flying, because it is, because we only see you twice a week. Not the best scenario, but we have to deal with it. But, so, you have to stay on top of it, and again, read instructions very carefully about what your tasks are, Okay? Any questions? We have a question. Okay, we'll do top hat at the end of class today. We'll do top hat at the end of class. And let's go back to this. Okay, so we're talking we're using these bars and you've been practicing. Again, it's this is not about learning how to do bar diagrams. That's not what we're doing. We're, it's not like, oh, these are these new kind of problems that we're learning in Calc, bar diagrams. No, bar diagrams are a way to represent and reason about what? Quantities. Quantities, real world quantities. Real world quantities that are changing. So it's a way to model what's really important, and that's quantities. So throughout the whole course, students who focus on the quantities in the situation, the problem at hand, are the ones who are gonna succeed. If you're just trying to recall some procedure, we talked all about that Thursday. If you're just trying to recall some steps that you're going to follow, a method to follow, you're going to, you're going to be dead in the water. You have to focus on the quantities and how they're changing. Okay, so we've got two, we talked about two quantities here. And we said that the red quantity was, right here. the red quantity was the volume of, water in milliliters, and this was in a test tube, okay? And then we said that the blue bar was the height of the water in the test tube in centimeters. So uh, let me ask a question. So what's the relative size of the amount of volume with respect to height, based on this picture that you're looking at, based on the red and the blue, the lengths of those bars, what would you estimate is the relative size of the volume with respect to the height? Get my list out. What do you think? Just shout it out. Four. What do you think? Four. One four. Okay, I got four and I got one fourth. What is it? I'm asking for the relative size of the volume with respect to the height. What's the magnitude of the amount of water relative to how high the water is stacking up? About four. About four. Okay, yeah. All right, and so then what about the relative size of the height compared to the volume? What's, how would you, if you're measuring the height in the unit of the volume, what would that be? One fourth, right? One fourth. So, and what operation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division, gives us a result of relative size? Division. Because if I took this height of water, whatever that value was, and divided by the volume of the water, what number would I get? 
what number? One fourth. I would get one fourth, right? So the size of the height. So the, this is the meaning of a quotient. It's relative size of one quantity with respect to the other. Okay? And then we said that we could look at a different setup. So now there's more volume of water in the test tube, but because its sides are straight up and down, we're going to get that same relative size of the height, one quarter the number of centimeters relative to the number of milliliters of water in the test tube. Okay? So I can, we talked about creating graphs. If I take that, that current value of the height and flip it up on its end at the end of the volume bar and throw this on a graph, okay? I can get a point right there. What is the meaning of that point? Tell the person next to you, what is the meaning of that point right there? Okay, who can interpret the meaning of that point? What do you think? This is really, really important. Okay, somebody new. Somebody new. How about in the pink sweatshirt right here? What's the meaning of that point? The comparison between, the, that point is the comparison between volume and height. In the blue shirt, yeah. That point is the slope. Adam. Nice love. Okay, we're getting closer. He said it's the height of water in centimeters when the volume is? Okay, five milliliters. And what is that height if it's five? Okay, so a point on a graph is two values taken together. Two values taken together. It's not just one thing. It's two values taken together. This is a five milliliter volume and the corresponding height, which we know is one quarter as much because the relative size of height to volume is one quarter. So five and, is that 1.25? Five milliliters in the test tube, a height of 1.25 centimeters. That's what that point means. If you said or, or, or discussed anything else than that, and you're off track. That point is two values taken together. Two val values of two different quantities taken together, corresponding, right? So we can imagine filling up the test tube. And this is the way we want to conceive of graphs. Filling up the test tube, how many points do we get? <coughs> Point by point, each point representing an amount of volume and the corresponding height. All right, so then we said, let's, let's put a plane on there and think of the vapor trail of the plane. Where's the plane? Here it is. Point by point, we get a volume and a corresponding height. Those points create the graph. Those points create the graph. Okay, so. We see this. 
So this is what you're used to seeing all through your math career. A line or a curve that you could just draw with your sweep with your pencil. But when you see that, what do you imagine now? No, you imagine a set of points being swept out as the quantities change together. When you see a graph, a line, or a curve, you imagine you're, you're looking at a set of points. Each point, two values taken together. And where do we get, how, where do we look to see the values of the quantities for a given point? Where do we look? At the top. We look at the top, up here. We look up here to see those values. No, where do we look to see, given a point, where do we look to see those values? Do we know what these are called? So you're probably thinking it? The axes. The axes are where we see the values of those points. Okay, so let's do another one here. Say it. Speak to your partner a sentence that, that explains what that point means. Go. What does that point mean? New volunteer, what does that point mean? Use values in your description. New volunteer. I'll put it in the class shirt right here. Yeah. Okay. So we said that the height of the water relative to the direction of the two types of the Okay, so I heard you say, so 7.1 or 2, is that the first coordinate or the second coordinate? So 7.2. So you can start by saying, when there's 7.2 milliliters of water in the test tube, keep going. The corresponding height is 1.8 centimeters. When there's about 7.2 milliliters in the test tube, the corresponding height is about 1.8 centimeters. That's what you should have said. Do we know these numbers for sure? No, because I just picked a point and so you have to approximate. If you're given a point, all you, the best you can do is just approximate what you're looking at on the scale. So we approximate 7.2, approximate 1.8 here. But that's the best we can do. How many points am, am I showing now? How many points am I showing on this graph? Four. Hearing four or five. Yeah. I haven't heard the right answer yet. An infinite number of points. This graph shows an infinite number of points. I'm just highlighting five. When you look at a graph, you have to think it's points. Each point showing two values of quantities that correspond. Okay, so graphs are one way. This is a visual way of representing uh, two quantities and what's happening as they change together. So now we have to talk about symbolically. How do we represent quantities and especially quantities taken together? So that's that's this idea of covariation. Okay, covariation is how two quantities change together. Don't try to write this down. I'm just going to fly through it. We started with multiplication and division. These are the basics of changing quantities and measurement. We just talked about visual representation, Co horizontal bars. And how a graph just comes right out of horizontal bars if you flip that other one up, right? So now what, what about symbolic representation of quantities and covariation, okay? This is function notation. So should be review, but uh, it may be kind of a new way of looking at it, and it's super important in this course. So 
Let's talk about this scenario. Here, a distance a motorcycle travels since beginning at an intersection in miles as a function of the time elapsed since leaving the intersection in minutes. Do I have well-defined quantities there? Is there any doubt what we're talking about? No, so whenever you have quantities, if you're defining them, make sure they're very well defined. Okay, and so now this. What does this mean? Your understanding of looking at notation like this is crucial to your success in the course. Okay, so what does this mean? So before we get to what it means, there's actually three parts. When you look at this, you should be look you're looking actually at three things <coughs> taken together. So let's dissect it first, look at the three things, and then say as a whole, what does it mean? So the first part is the 8.3. 8.3 is the input. In this situation, it's a number of minutes. Okay? The G. G is the name of the function. G represents the relationship. It does not represent a value. So oftentimes, uh, in, the, it's, in error, it's, people will say that G is the output or G is a number. No, G is just the name and G represents the relationship of the two quantities. Okay, so where do we see the output here? Where do we see the output in this expression? The whole thing is the output, okay? The whole thing is the output, in this case, a number of miles. So three things all together there in that expression. Input, the function represent, represented itself as that letter G, the name, and then the output, the whole thing. Okay, so therefore, G of 8.3 is, can you finish the sentence? G of 8.3 is, finish the sentence, okay? Tell the person next to you, what is G of 8.3? Go. Okay, I want you to interpret it two different ways. You, there's an interpretation of that just in terms of the terms input and output. And then there's an interpretation of that in terms of our motorcycle situation. So do it both ways. Do both ways. Okay, here, so compare what you said to the two possibilities here. The first possibility is, it's the output of the function g when the input is 8.3. It's the output of the function g when the input is 8.3. And so then in the motorcycle scenario, that's the motorcycle's distance from the intersection. Actually, it's, it should be motorcycle's distance traveled. Distance traveled, okay? That's Because that's the way I defined it up here, so... Just to be precise. Okay, so motorcycle's distance traveled at 8.3 minutes after leaving the intersection. Crucial that you could just look at that without even thinking and see, oh, this is the output of a function. It's the, it's the particular output when the input is whatever in the parentheses, in this case, 8.3. And so now we apply the quantities. That would be the distance traveled by the motorcycle at 8.3 minutes after leaving the intersection. In other words, it's the value of a quantity. That's the point. When you see notation like this, you're looking at the particular value of a quantity. So that, in, in other words, when there's a number in the input, okay, when there's a number in the input. Okay, but 
you may have, uh, in your past training, you may have come to see this more as a command to do something, right? Plug in 8.3, crank out, crank out an answer. It's not a command to do something. You say, well, what's the difference? It's the same thing. No, it's different. Okay, g of 8.3 is a value, and I'll prove that it's different because we could represent that function as a table. That's a perfectly legitimate representation of this function g. What is g of 8.3? Is it a command to do algebra and crank out something? No, what is g of 8.3? What is it? 6.54 miles. You see, g of 8.3 is 6.54 miles. How, many, how far the motorcycle has traveled? It's not a command to do something. Okay, also, graph... Graph representation, okay, perfectly, so maybe this is the only representation we have of this function g. And we know that the point on that function, there's at some point that has a time leaving of 8.3. And what's the corresponding distance from the intersection? So what are the coordinates of that point? What are the coordinates of that point? 8.3 and? Okay, 6.54 according to the table, but I could write it this way. 8.3 and G of 8.3. And so again, it's, it's, it's not representing anything to do with plugging in a number and cranking out something. It's representing a value. What? The distance, again, distance traveled, distance traveled. I got the wrong uh, label on the vertical axis there, but distance traveled at 8.3. And we know that point came from, where did that point come from? It came from those two quantities changing together, right? Just like our bars. Just like our bars. Yes. Okay, so these two examples show that g of 8.3 is not some uh, command for you to crank something out. It's a value. It's a value. It's an output value. That being said, what about this function? Here's, just, you've seen many of these in your math career. So, what is it? What is f of 2? Is the general meaning the same or the different than the general meaning of g of 8.3 in the previous example? General meaning is exactly the same. It's a value. It's a value, right? Okay? So identify the three parts and I then say what the meaning of f of 2 is. Go. Identify the three parts of what you're looking at and then what's the meaning of f of 2? Okay, what's the first part? What's the first part? Yeah. Two is the input. He said two is the input, agree? Yes. Yes. And F is the output, right? <laughs> no. no. F is the name. F is not a value. F represents the whole relationship. F represents the whole relationship between input and output. F is the name, and the output is seen. F of 2. Therefore, the meaning of F of 2 is? How about in the maroon sweat, sweatshirt here? Yeah. What's the meaning of F of 2? What kind of value is it? There's only two possibilities. Value of output. Which value of output is it? Okay, which value of output is it? Say it nice and loud. When the input is two. Which value of output is it? It's the value of it's the output when the input is two. It's the output when the input is two. Now, if you want to know what that number is, we can crank it out. Anyone do it? Negative three, okay? Negative three. 
So if you want to know, if you have a rule, if you have, a, if you have an algebraic rule and you want to know what the value is, then you can crank it out. But f of 2 means that output value when the input is 2, in this case negative 3. Okay, so this is what you learned in your homework. That thing is called the rule. Calculates output. Over here, function notation. It also represents the output, but it does that whether there's a rule or not. So it could the function could be based on the table, it could be based on a graph, or it could just be something we describe. Okay, it's you know the function is your height over ever since you were born. So where the input quantity is your age, okay? So that, that's function. So the function notations can still represent that output of your height where the input is the time that you've been alive. Okay, so when complicated functions are built from other functions, it's very convenient to use function notation and not the rule. So we have over on the side, we have the, the definition that tells us what the rule is. But when building other functions, say from this function f, it's very convenient then to use f of x, knowing that that represents the output. OK, so here's a definition we're going to build in the next month. And you're going to count. How many times does function notation appear? OK, are you ready? Here we go. How many times in this function definition do you see function notation? Go, count them. See if you can figure it out. Oh, no, it's not just once. It's a lot more than that. Talk about it. Okay, notice J is a number. J is a number. It's not a name of a function. J is a number, not the name of a function. X is the input. Delta X is a number. It's not the name of a function. All right, let's see how you did. Okay, ready? Here we go. There's one. Left is the name of a function with input x. Left is the name of a function with input So there's one. We see it again there. There's two. R is the name of a function. There's three. R is used over here, too. That's four. And then the definition says five times. Five times. Wait, what? What's your question? So I'll just underline it. Okay? Left of x. That's function notation. That's the output of the function left when the input is x. Here it is again. R is a function. So this is the output of the function R when the input is the output of left when its input is x. Okay? This is whole thing right there. That's the output of R when the input into R is this expression. And then, of course, so then this whole thing is defining a function named A, whose input is X. Okay, so here's the beauty of this. Using function notation for this function, so, so R is a rate function. So this, using function notation, allows us to write this single rule the single function rule for the function a, it will apply to any rate function. So we start with a rate function, pick any one you want. There's a zillion. There's a zillion rate functions you could pick. This a function then, uh, then 
is based on whatever rate function you pick, and that's the beauty of function notation. That we don't have to rebuild this function different for every single rate function that you have. Because if you were using the rule for the rate function, r, then you'd have a different a function for every different rate function that exists, which is as many as you want. Using function notation allows us to write the a function just once, and it applies to every rate function that you could think of or use. Does it make sense? So yes. this is why the function notation is so important. OK, so we did that already. So let's go back and look at. Uh, what's here? So here's a graph. OK, and so this graph is. The, uh, this quantity down here is, we'll say, so x is uh, seconds. Seconds elapsed since the ride began. So this is something to do with an amusement park ride, okay? so. A ride begins, and then we start the clock. And this this quantity down here on the uh, horizontal axis is the number of seconds since the ride began. Okay, and then up here, our y-axis is uh, distance in meters. How did I do defining that quantity, distance in meters? Well. Good. No, so. How many, there's a, a thousand different distances you could measure relative to some ride. Okay, so we want to be specific. Distance in meters between you and your friend. You guys are in different cars. Okay. Tell the person next to you what's the meaning of that point. Go, what's the meaning of that point? Okay, you should have said something like, at, a, at 0.8 seconds after the ride began, at about 0.8 seconds after the ride began, you're about 1.3 meters from your friend. That's what you should say. That's what that point means. At about 0.8 seconds, if you're given a point, you, all you can do is approximate. And those approximations come from the axis scales. That's where you get those values. At about 0.8 seconds, you're about 1.3 meters away from your friend. Okay, now let's talk about the specific time of x equals 0.5. So now we are precisely saying 0.5 seconds have gone by, okay? Where on the graph, where in this whole illustration is 0.5 seconds represented? Where in this whole illustration is 0.5 seconds illustrated or represented? Yeah. I'm asking where in this graph is this value of 0 0.5 seconds represented? Don't try to answer a question you think I'm asking. Answer my question. On the x-axis, right here. Don't try to answer. Yeah, it's like you're thinking I'm answering something else. All right. What is the exact distance between you and your friend at 0 0.5 seconds? What is the exact distance between you and your friend between at 0 0.5 seconds. Once you think you got it, raise your hands. What is the exact distance between you and your friend? What do you think? 
distance. And what are you going to say, Matt? D of 0 0.5 is the exact distance. If I give you an exact input, now I can say exactly that D of 0 0.5 meters is the exact distance between you if this function is y is D of x. And then from, the, from here, if I don't have a rule, the best I can do then is approximate that value. But this, D of 0.5 meters, is an exact representation of the distance between you and your friend at 0.5 minutes, whatever. So the coordinates of this point are 0 0.5, D of 0 0.5. If we want an approximation, we look here. That's where we look to find an approximation for that value. Unless we had a rule. So if, if we had a rule or a table that could give us that exact value, then we could find it. But we can represent it exactly with function notation. That's, that's the beauty of it. We can say d of 0 0.5 is exactly how far you and your friend are apart. OK. Any questions? And again, and then we think about when you see this graph, what image should you have of this pink, purple, whatever it is, purple graph? Your image is? Many, many, many points that emerge as time goes by, right? So come over here. Let's change this up. Sorry. Too far and too fast. This is graphing calculator before, by the way, so this is what you'll be using. How about the relative size of these two quantities? What is different about the relative size of these two quantities compared to all the examples we looked at before? It's not constant, right? All the examples we've used so far, if we change one quantity, we saw that the relative size was maintained. But here in this right example, it's, cha it's constantly changing. That relative size between those two quantities is constantly changing. So here we have we got time uh, extending forward by the red bar, and then your distance between your friend is represented by the blue bar. And that relative size is constantly changing. All right, so we can do what we did before. And that graph that I showed you before, how do we see it? This is the way we think about it. Okay, we think about that graph emerging as time goes by, leaving point by point by point, each point representing a time and a distance between you and your friend. So that that's the graph. OK, anybody have a question? All right, so let's do some work with graph and calculator. So if you've got your laptop, get it out and open it up. You should see this. This is the first thing you should see if it opens up correctly. And I, I, I got one email about issues downloading this, so I'm assuming that we are good. Are we good?
So the first thing about graphing calculator is that it's a very powerful just numerical calculator, okay? So you can do 5.3 plus 6 divided by 7 pi. And then the, the current value of the expression just pops up over here on the right. So now if I take that whole thing, highlight it, and hit divide, it'll make that thing the numerator. I can divide by 74, and then just continually, as long as you have a valid expression, it's continually updating the value of that expression. Right now, the value of my expression is 0 0.108. Yeah? PI, I'm oh, sorry, pi is PI. I meant to tell you. So pi, just type PI, and it pops up as pi. Yeah, just, just start typing. Something's wrong. You gotta we'll have to figure that out later. Okay? So square root, square root on a Mac is option V. On a PC is control shift R. Control shift R gives you square root. So for instance, oh I just if I if I highlight the six sevenths pi, I want the square root of that. I'm gonna do option V. And now it takes the square root of just that part. It updates the it updates the uh, value of the expression. Okay, to start a new command line, command enter, command enter. What is it for? Control enter. Control for PC. Control enter for. Uh, Mac, command enter. So you can, with square root, you can just start, you don't have to so you don't have to do the middle part first and highlight it, you can just do it from the beginning. So you can just do option V, the square root comes up, and then you can type in whatever you want. 45.9 plus 23. Okay, if you're on a Mac, it's option V. If you're on a PC, uh, PC it's Control Shift R. Okay, for exponents, it has a, has squared and cubed built in. All you have to do is hit Shift Two, and you get squared. Shift Two. Similarly, Shift Three is automatically cubed. Oops, what did I have? Forty-five. Just out, right arrow, right arrow out of it. To get out of the square root, you just hit right arrow and it, it ends the expression. Okay, any other exponent, you're going to use the caret. So you do shift six, and now you're ready to put in any other exponent you want. So 23 to the pi plus square root of 45.9. Uh, that's just the it's a new command line. You're gonna do Control Enter gives you a new command line. So for PC, Control Enter starts a new command line. On Mac, Command Return, or Command Enter starts a new command line. <laughs> so you've got full copy, pedit, uh, copy, cut, and paste function. So say I want, uh, I just want this, the square root thing up here. So I can highlight, maybe. I can highlight that, I can copy, and then come down to my new command line and paste. It'll give me just that thing that I, so you have full copy, cut, and paste uh, capabilities within a command line or between different command lines. Yeah? On the top command, how are you getting everything Highlight the whole thing, and then hit divide. So if you want it, so yeah, so you can do that. Parentheses also, to get parentheses, when you do shift nine, the left parentheses, it gives you both every time. Okay? So when you do shift nine, it gives you the whole set of parentheses. You never have to close parentheses. You can highlight something and put parentheses around it. Okay? So you've got lots of nice kind of editing features that you have on a computer that you wouldn't have on a graphing calculator in terms of calculations.
We don't have time for this. This was just a practice. Um, you can out, this will be in the video. You can try it later. But this is just a practice setting up one expression that would calculate this, um, this area outside the circle, inside the trapezoid, given these two formulas. Okay? So if you want to just play around with that, that's just building expressions. So uh, a whole one expression calculating the value without having to do it piecemeal, right? So that's, that's the beauty of this. You can, and then if you need to edit something in your expression, you just can do it quickly just by going in there and editing it. Okay? So you can try that at home if you're interested. Let's move on. So here is a little example. The cost of materials in dollars for a certain rectangular box with base dimension L feet and W. L feet by W feet is given by this. The cost is 4LW plus 288 over L plus 96 over W. Okay, so here's... Uh, three particular boxes, an 8 by 4, a 2.6 by 5.9, and a 10 by 7.25. And so don't use any letters. Just use numbers and find the cost of each box. Don't use any letters. We'll get to the letters in a second. Just find the cost of each box with expre numerical expressions like these. Go. <clears throat> No letters, only numbers, just like the examples we just did. Just You're just using numeric calculations to calculate the cost of each of these three boxes. Is the task clear? Does that make, make sense? Okay. So just like you would see in textbooks, the way that you can multiply, you can use uh, parentheses or <coughs> asterisk. So here's examples of both. They both work. So notice the first I used uh, asterisk to do my multiplication, 4 times 8 times 4. Here I did parentheses. Reads it both just like uh, standard nomenclature. And it'll read it the same both ways. So the first two boxes have a very similar cost, although they're very different boxes, right? Very different boxes, but the cost is almost exactly the same. So this is direct calculation. You can use graphing calculator as a just plain old calculator. Questions on that? Okay, so now let's talk about using what we call parameters. So what I can do here is 
I can set up a formula. I can say C, C is going to be my cost, equals 4LW plus 288 divided by L. So now, just like square root, to get out of the fraction, if you hit the right arrow now, if, you keep, if I keep going now, it'll just keep me in the denominator. If I hit the right arrow, it'll pull me out of that fraction. So plus 96 <coughs> over W. So what did this do? This just dis defined a formula. It's not going to calculate anything. This command line just defines... Maybe. I'm stuck. What's going on? I don't know what's going on. But so here, look, I can copy, copy that and paste it into an even a new file. That, and now hopefully this works. Why can't I get a new command line? Oh, caps lock. OK, there we go. So that, that the blue line, there, the one with the blue square, just defined this. It didn't calculate anything. It just defined something. OK, so now watch this. If I hit, if I just hit, say, capital L, I get a 1 there. So what is it doing? It's, it's saying that the value of L is 1. When you have not defined the value of a what we call a parameter, a letter, it, by default, it gives it the value 1. So right now, we're, we're asking graphic calculator, tell us what the value of L is. And it's saying, oh, it's 1, because you haven't told me anything. So what do I want L to be? 8. OK? Now L is 8. Now graphic calculator knows that L is 8. What do I want W to be? Again, look, if I just hit W, it tells me it's 1 until I actually define it as something else. 4. So how am I going to find the cost now? We've got L is 8, W is 4, and the cost is defined by the blue line. Well, what do I do? All I have to do is hit C. And it tells me the current value of C. So putting C here is something different than putting C here. By saying C equals this expression, that defines the formula. In an another command line, if I just type C, now it'll tell me what the value of C is because it's based on L and the values of L and W. Yeah. What's that? Uh, you just said you have to do it line by line. If you just if you just hit delete, it'll it'll do fast. Okay, so now if I want the third box or the, say the second box, all I have to do now is change L to two point six, change W to five point nine. The formula is still intact. Now it gives me C one eighty eight point four, which we saw before. Does it make sense? Yes. Okay, so, moving on. In terms of parameters, here are parameters that are reserved. They're not free parameters. So like this capital C, capital L, capital W, those are free parameters, and there's hundreds, okay? Hundreds of free parameters, but there are some letters that are reserved for special use in graphing calculators, so we should know about those. X and Y represent the x and y axes, so it has to do with graphing. So whenever you want to get something to graph, that's when you're going to use x and y. So don't use x and y as parameters to stand for a value of quantity. Okay? Z, likewise, is reserved to represent a z-axis. So x, y, z coordinate system is three-dimensional space. So little x, little y, and little z are uh, axes scales or coordinates. Okay? Don't use those. R. If you've done polar coordinates, R means the radius in polar coordinates or in cylindrical coordinates. Theta and phi are reserved for angles in polar coordinates or spherical coordinates. Okay, little t. Don't use little t for parameter, okay? It is, represents a parametric variable. Don't use it as a constant. It represents a parametric variable. Uh, we won't get into that right now. Similarly, u and v are reserved for parameters. 
e, pi, and i are their fixed value in the way they are defined in the math world, right? e is a number, pi is a number, i is a number, and so by using either e, pi, or i, you actually don't define a, a parameter to be those because those are reserved to be their actual values by convention. Okay, n, little lowercase n. <coughs> we'll talk about that, but that's that's the symbol used for a, a built-in slider. So you saw the stuff we've been doing with the bars, and you saw down below there was the slider thing, right? That's lowercase n, okay? We'll discuss that later. So we want to stay away from these. So a safe bet is uppercase, right? Uppercase letters or lowercase letters that are not X, Y, Z, R, E, I, U, V, and T. Okay, but so uppercase letters are usually a safe bet if you just want a free parameter to use. Okay, so a third way is to use functions like we just learned. Okay, so function notation. So instead of uh, setting this up as a formula with a parameter, we can set it up as a function definition. So I could use a single letter like f or g for a function, or I could use a string of letters like we saw the left. Remember that one example? I showed you left x. So let's do that. Let's do cost. So to get that, you're going to do to, to make a string of letters mean just the name of a function, you're going to use the uh, for, let's see this, backslash, which is right above the enter key. Start with backslash. And then let's type cost, capital C-O-S-T. And then when you hit forward slash or backslash again, it'll disappear. And now it sees that string of letters cost as a single parameter or name of a function. So it's seeing that thing cost as just like the ones above, as capital C or just, just as one thing, one thing. To set up to define a function now, instead of using, you want parentheses, but you don't want multiplication operation parentheses, you want function parentheses. This is crucial. So you're going to hit control 9, not shift 9. When you hit control 9, you get a set of parentheses, but this, now it knows you're defining function notation. Hugely important. If you're just using parentheses in operations, you want just parentheses, shift 9. But if you're setting up or using function notation, you need control 9. And you'll see the parentheses are a little bit closer. That's the kind of your tip off. For function notation, they're a little bit closer. Yeah? So, what do I do again to make that look like a cost? Okay, so to make a character string, so everyone listen really closely. To make a character string, this is, you're going to do backslash, which is above that, and so then we'll do length this time. Type out length, do backslash again, and it makes the word length mean a single thing. A single thing, like I, a single letter. Okay, so now I'm going to define my cost function. Say cost as a function of, what do I want? As two inputs. So I'm going to do L comma W. Equals, and now what's the rule? This is still the rule for given an L and a W, calculates the cost. So I can copy and paste. And now I've just defined it as a, a cost function. Cost is the name of the function. We have two inputs. So our rule has could be based on two different values. And so how am I going to get the value of the cost of the first box? What am I going to do? So this is what we learned. How am I going to, what should I write to get the value, the cost of the first box? We want the output when the input is 8 and 4, when the inputs are 8 and 4. How do we represent the output of the cost function when the inputs are 8 and 4? Function notation, cost, comma. You don't, so now from now on, you don't need the backslashes. Just type cost and it'll know that you mean that one thing, that name of that function. Remember, function notation gives us the output when the input is, etc. This is the output of the cost function when the input is, inputs are 8 and 4. There it is, 188, same cost. So we want the cost of the second one. 
Function notation gives us the output of the function when the inputs or input are given. There it is, 188.4. So graphing calculator works just like all the conventions in the math, most of the conventions in the mathematical world. So all the stuff I, you learned in your homework and we t talked about in class about functions, function notation representing the output for a given input. There it is. We, I put in the output for a given input. It told me what the value was. Cost. Last box. 10, comma, 7.25. We're going to be using graphing calculator and using this function capability all semester. So that's why you need, and it's, it works the same way as we just learned early in class. If you want the output of a function and you've defined that function, then you're just going to use function notation. What does that represent? That represents the output of the cost function when the inputs are 10 and 7.25. And then it calculates it. It tells you what the value is. Do you see how that's matching up with exactly what you learned in homework and today, earlier? You said it should make sense. And so that's why this is why function notation is so convenient and powerful. Because we can represent a value without having to calculate it. And we can let graphing calculator calculate it. All right? And we can, but we can still represent what that value is. Okay, quickly, graphing. All right, so I think to delete stuff, if you just hold down delete, it'll do it pretty quick. So I said earlier that X and Y are reserved for graphing. So I shouldn't have done all that. But that's okay. So if I want to graph something, I can say y equals, say square root of x. Now this is telling graphing calculator to graph y equals square root of x. Hit graph, it comes up. Option V or control shift R. Okay, I can restrict if I hit comma and I say 1 is less than x is less than 5, then it will only show that graph between 1 and 5. So I can restrict the domain with a comma. I can just say, just plot it over this domain from 1 to 5. It's, this pro program has really nice zooming capabilities. So down here in the lower left corner, this little mountain here means zoom out. So every time I do that, I zoom out. The big mountain means zoom in. But here's what's especially nice. You can zoom in on one or the other axes. Okay, so if you hit, if you hold on to control, do you see little arrows that appear uh, over this? Why should option? Sorry, command command. So uh, for PC, when you hit Control, what do, what do you, what arrows do you see? Up and down or left and right? Yes. Left and right. So for if you want to zoom in or zoom out on the x-axis only, on a Mac you're going to hit Option. On PC you're going to hit Control. Hold it down and you see you get these little arrows. So if I'm just zooming in on the x-axis, or just zooming out on the x-axis by holding down option or control. Also, you can just grab your axes and move, okay? So if I want to get this in the picture here, I'll say I want to zoom out on the x-axis. Now my x-axis is, is going by ones, and my y-axis is going by point ones. Okay, if you want to zoom in or out on the y-axis, it's command, on Mac, what is it on PC? Shift. Shift. So now I want to zoom, say zoom out on the y-axis. It's only zooming out on the y-axis now. Or zoom in on the y-axis by holding that down and clicking on that button. So you can, you can move around just by grabbing the axis and moving. And then you can shift on either axis by using the option command or control shift buttons. Holding them down and hitting those. Quick question. How do you, when you're doing domain, 
how would you set up for it to be one less than equal to x less than the bottom? So less than or equal to uh, would be instead of shift on the Mac, it's option comma or option period gives less than or equal to. But I don't know what it is on PC. Wait, I've got it right here. Sorry. Control shift. Control shift comma gives you less than or equal to. Control shift period gives you greater than or equal to on a PC. Okay, and you're gonna read. So in the in the reading, there's a lot more. There's a lot of a repeat of what we did, and then more detail. So read carefully. If you're stuck trying to do something, just go back and read really carefully. It, it leads you through like you wouldn't need any additional instructions. So just read that reading carefully when you're working in GC. One more question. Is that sheet posted anywhere? Yeah. So there, I'm going to have this posted. The um, keyboard shortcuts is posted on Blackboard in its own area. Okay. Top hat. <laughs>